I'm Prashant. I work at Uber on the RPC team. I work on our open source RPC protocol called T-Channel, available on GitHub under uh, Uber's GitHub page. I also work on our fleet-wide routing, um, load balance, routing and load balancing sidecar, and I maintain some of the Go infrastructure at Uber. Before Uber, I worked at Google, which is actually where I learned Go, and I learned a lot from a lot of the Go reviewers there. Today's talk is going to focus on profiling and optimizing Go. I'm going to cover the tools at a pretty high level, and then we're going to jump in to some code and actually get some hands-on experience with it. So one of the great things about Go is that it has really rich profiling tools included that build right into the runtime and the standard library. It has a bunch of options, so the first is CPU profiling. CPU profiling uses stack sampling, which basically means that every so often it will look at what's running on the CPU and record the full call stack. There's heap profiling, which means a small percentage of all your allocations are profiled. It records exactly where it happened and the call stack at that point. And there's a bunch of other profiles like block profiling, which is for contention on locks. There's tracing and so on. All of these are built into the pprof and runtime packages. Um, just a side note, if you're on OS X, you have to install this kernel patch um, unless you're using the latest OS X. It's by Russ Cox, who is reasonably trustworthy, I think, so uh, it should be fine. Now, for profiles, you need to first create a profile. So what that means is you basically need to record, instrument your binary, you're recording what's happening, and you're generating a binary profile out of it. And there's a few ways you can do that. The first is through the uh, tests and benchmarks. So when you're running Go test, you can pass dash CPU profile or dash mem profile, and that generates a profile. The second, which is really useful for backend services that are running in production, is to blank import the net HTTP pprof package. This adds a few endpoints under slash debug slash pprof as we saw earlier. Uh, once you have those installed, you can run go tool pprof and target your endpoint directly, and it records a profile over HTTP and sends it to the go tool. There is another option which is rarely used, but might be useful is you can actually start the profile directly from your application itself. You might be debugging something really strange and you, know, you might have a special me like a memory leak that you can't really find and you need to ex execute um, a heap profile at a specific point in time. And you can do that by calling runtime.write heap profile. Similarly, you can also start a CPU profile from the runtime package. Once you have these profiles, you analyze them using the go tool pprof. So the standard interface for GoTool pprof is this command line thing where it shows you a whole bunch of information about what functions are taking up how much time. You can even have a view of which lines of code exactly are taking up time. It even lets you dig into the disassembly and see exactly which instruction is taking up time. This is really great when you want to dig deep into a specific function, but it can be a little bit harder to get a high-level overview of where time is being spent. And so there is another way, which is the web or SVG command, which generates a more visual view for the pprof output. This, uh, this shows you the call graph, so it shows you the arrows kind of show what's calling what. The size of the box shows how much time is spent inside of that function. It's a pretty great view for where time's being spent, but as your programs get bigger, so do your pprof graphs. And it can get a little bit tricky to find out what's happening when it's this complicated. And that's actually why we at Uber Gener uh, built this tool called GoTorch. So GoTorch is a program that uh, generates these things called flame graphs, which are common in the Node and Python communities. It takes the same data that comes out of pprof, but renders the data differently. In a flame graph, the y-axis, so going up and down here, shows the stack depth. The top box shows the function that's actually running on your CPU. Everything beneath is a list of callers. Unlike most graphs, the x-axis doesn't actually represent the passage through time. This is a very common mistake. The position, the x-position doesn't actually mean anything. Uh, the width of the box signifies how long that function spent on the CPU. So a wider box means it spent a lot of time, maybe because the function's slow, but it could also be because the function gets caught a lot. Contrary to what you might expect, the colors don't actually mean anything. They're just randomly chosen to look 
like fire. <laughs> so you can learn more about flame graphs on Brendan Gregg's uh, page, and that's linked from this slide here. GoTorch generates these flame graphs from the same data that GoTool PProf uses. So you can use them with the same profiles, whether you get them from the dash CPU profile when running your tests, or from the net HTTP PProf endpoint. So now, let's jump into some code. All right, uh, is the size okay? Yep, cool. So this is a uh, simple web service. Let's imagine we were given this code and told, hey, this slash hello handler that you have here is just too slow. So let's first uh, look around in the code. We'll see that we have um, a few things registered here. We have three endpoints. One is just an index page that links to the other two. We have a hello and a slash simple. So let's have a look at what slash simple is. Um, so slash simple is just a, the most basic HTTP endpoint, just prints hello world. Now there's this ha uh, slash hello, which is the same thing, but it's got handlers dot with stats. So let's take a quick look at that. Oh. And with stats is basically a middleware that's wrapping our handler. So it still calls the handle that you passed in but it wraps it with some latency tracking and counters. So this is typically what you do in a HTTP backend service if you want to track metrics for how your service is performing. So let's now run this and look at the results of this. As you'd expect, the slash simple endpoint doesn't really do anything, just prints hello world. Uh, slash hello does the exact same, but there is a difference which, I forgot to run with print stats. When you refresh the slash hello endpoint, you'll see that there's a whole bunch of stats being recorded and printed to the console. If we refresh the simple endpoint, we can refresh it a few times, nothing's being recorded. So that's the only difference we have between slash simple and slash hello. Now, now that we've been told this slash hello endpoint slow, first we need to reproduce this and see what exactly is slow about it. So let's run a load tester. So we're gonna do a quick five second load test against the slash simple endpoint. And we see that we're getting about 42,000 requests per second. That's pretty good. Now let's run the same thing against the slash hello endpoint, which also has stats being recorded. All right, so we're seeing that there's like a 13,000 uh, requests per second difference. That's a pretty big difference for a uh, simple like measuring latency and recording the number of times an endpoint's hit. So what are we going to do to figure out what exactly is slow about this endpoint? First thing you're going to do is we're going to uh, create some background load and that's because for profiling when you access the net HP prof endpoint you need to have some load otherwise it's not recording anything. So I'm going to just make this load test go on for a little while longer. Um, while that's happening, I'm going to show you the debug pprof endpoints. So there's a bunch of different links here. This, uh, specifically, I find the GoRoutine link is extremely useful. It tells you what's running in your process right now. So this shows you that there's one GoRoutine at this stack. This stack is basically the actual um, GoRoutine that's serving the pprof page. So you can see it's writing the runtime profile for GoRoutines. There's one GoRoutine in this uh, serve waiting for accept. So this is the um, GoRoutine that's actually waiting on the socket that HTTP is set up. And there's 10 GoRoutines that are, you can kind of see they're serving requests. And that kind of makes sense. If you look at the load test, it actually is doing 10 GoRoutines. So we expect to see about 10, um, 10, 10 GoRoutines on the server side as well as serving each of these concurrent requests. Another link that's pretty useful is the slash heat page. The first, uh, most of the page actually is uh, not really useful to humans. It's more for the Go tool itself. Their locations in the binary, so they don't really make sense unless you use the Go tool to analyze them. But at the end of the page, you see these runtime.mem stats. These are really useful because they give you a pretty quick, um, pretty deep view into what the GC is doing. So one example is this numGC. You can see that every time I refresh it, numGC is going up, and that's because we're doing 30,000 requests per second in the back. Um, and then there's also this pause NS, which tells you the amount of time each GC uh, has taken. The last 25, the last 256 GC durations are recorded in this. All right, so 
Now we've had a look at the Go, uh, the PProf page, but now we actually want to get some data out of it. Why is my process slow? So the way we can do that is by running go to a pprof. We tell it how long to profile for, and we target our pprof page. There's a bunch of different endpoints. We saw the slash heap. We actually care about slash profile, which is where the CPU profiling data is, uh, comes from. Let's profile for five seconds. All right. So once you uh, download the profile, you can look around by looking at uh, top 10, which tells you what are the top 10 functions that time is being spent in. You can do top 10-cumulative, which includes the time spent in the function and any other functions it's called. But it can get a little bit hard to figure out what exactly is going on the process with the command line view. So let's jump into the SVG. So this SVG gives you a pretty good look in, oh, you can kind of see that there's three different areas where time is being spent. But even then, there's a lot of data in this graph. So, for example, I'll zoom into one of these boxes. This zero means that zero time was spent inside of the box. Of 4.43 means that in this box, in any of the callers, uh, any of the functions it called, 4.43 seconds was spent in total, and that's out of five seconds, uh, because that's what we profiled for. So you can kind of get a lot of information out of this graph, but it might be a little bit too much to figure out what exactly is going on. So let's try GoTorch. GoTorch can take the same arguments. Uh, it's going to run pprof under the hood to get the data. And it generates the flame graph. So let's open this flame graph. Now this flame graph makes it much easier to see that most of your time is spent in three different areas. One is the read path. One is the write for reading and writing from the HTTP connection. And then there's this third path, which is actually our handler. You can tell because there's serve HTTP. So what you can do is you can click in to zoom into that section only because there's not really much we can do to optimize the reading and writing of HTTP requests. That's handled by the runtime, and that's actually pretty fast already. Serve HTTP is our handler, and that's where uh, we're losing a fair bit of time. So as you could probably have guessed, uh, stats have something to do with it. You can see that out of the time that's spent in this serve HTTP function, almost all of it is in this get stats function, right? So we can click into get stats, and we can see that most of the time in the get stats function is actually because of os.hostname. So let's jump into our code and find this get stats function, um, get stat tags function. All right, so we found that get stat tags is calling this os.hostname function, and that's taking up a huge amount of time. Can anyone guess why it's taking up a lot of time? It's, it's not even that it needs to DNS, it's just that it's a syscall, it has to talk to the system to get the host name. But in the end, we actually don't really need to be doing this on a per request basis. I don't think the host name's gonna change uh, every single time for those 30,000 requests we're making every single second, right? So what we could do instead is, we could cache this. So instead of generating it every single time, let's store it in a global variable that we load once. So we're going to change this to a function. And then we're going to just store that in a, sorry, there we go. So we're going to store that in a global variable and use that as the stats tag. So let's see if that actually helped. We made a change, we run our server. We'll do a load test against the um, slash simple endpoint again, just so we can compare what the difference is now. And the slash hello endpoint, five seconds. All right, so it didn't look like it improved too much, which is a little bit disappointing. Let me just make sure I saved everything. <laughs> Let's run this again against slash hello. All right, there we go. That's a lot better. So we've already gotten 8,000 requests per second extra, and all we did is move one variable out of a hot loop and loaded it once instead. Now let's run another profile. So to do that, we need more background requests. And let's do go torch again to get the new profile, because we want to know what else is taking up time. What else can we do to optimize this code? So we open our torch and we see that almost all of the time is actually being spent in read and write now. 
That's great, but we, again, can't really do much about read and write. And just because read and write look like they're taking up a lot of time, it doesn't actually mean that they're taking up CPU. This just means that you're blocked on I.O. possibly. You're waiting for the OS to read or write some data, waiting on network, and so on. So what we want to do is, again, we just want to zoom into our handler. We're going to do that by clicking on serve HTTP, and we can see where our time is being spent now. So we can see that still it's with stats. With stats has the hello endpoint, which is saying a little bit of time, not too much. Um, there's the time.since, which is just recording how long it has to record the latency. We can't really optimize that out since we want the latency for every single request. But in the middle, we'll see that we have record timer and encounter. Both of those are calling the same function, add tags to name. And at this point, we could try to optimize add tags to name. We could try and figure out what's going on. But it's such a small percentage of the overall profile that doing it the same way we've currently been doing it isn't really going to work. We don't want to have to change it and then run a load test for five seconds with HTTP requests to figure out if it's really working. So there's just not enough samples. So what we can do instead is we can actually write a benchmark in Go. So Go makes it really easy to add benchmarks. You just use the benchmark prefix for a function. Um, and the big difference is instead of taking a testing.t, you take a testing.b. And the contract is that you run some function b.n times. So we're going to run b.n times, and we're going to go add tags to name. We need some name and some tags. Let's just copy some tags from the test above. And we'll add a host tag as well. All right, so now that we have a benchmark, we can run the benchmark by going go test dash bench. And I'm going to add dash bench mem. What bench mem does is it prints out the number of allocations that are happening for every single iteration of that loop. And the reason I tend to do this is you'll often find a correlation between the amount of time taken as well as the number of allocations you're doing. It's very often that the more allocations you do, the slower your code is. So let's run this. And this is how you run a benchmark. It tells you approximately how much time it's taking for each iteration, which is about five microseconds right now. And it tells us that we're doing 16 allocations. Now, like I said earlier, we can easily pass dash CPU profile, and that's now going to record a profile that only includes the add tags to name function. So we can look at this profile. One other difference, uh, one other important note is that when you use dash CPU profile or dash mem profile, Go, Go also builds the test binary. And that's because the profile just has binary data with no information about what symbols and so on. The binary is the binary is used to find the symbol name for those locations. So we run go to a pprof by passing the binary first and then the profile. All right, now we're in a profile. We kind of, we can use the command line. We can see that there's some sort of regex thing happening here that's taking up a lot of time. Um, we can also try and look specifically at a function. So we can just say, hey, if I list add tags to name, where is my time being spent? And you can see that a lot of time is spent on this line here, which is where um, clean is being called. Now, there's two things here. It says 10 ms and 1.29 ms. It means that the line itself, the append function here, is taking 10 ms, but 1.29 seconds are taken up by the function that's being called. So in this case, we're calling clean, and clean is actually what's taking up a lot of time. So let's have a look at clean, and you can see that 1.06 seconds are spent because we're using a regex to replace some uh, special characters with a dash. So that's a pretty long time for just replacing uh, any special characters with a dash. Why is it so slow? Is it because regexes are slow? It's not that regexes are slow, but it's more that they're very general. Regexes can't assume anything about the input and output. For example, in this case, I know that each input character is going to result in exactly one output character. The length, of the, uh, the length of the clean string is going to be exactly the same as the input. And so I can do a much better job for this specific case than a regex can. So let's try to do that. How would we write this without using a regex? Uh, go makes it pretty easy to go over a string. So first thing we're going to do is... Um, we're going to build the result itself, and we know that the result is going to be the same length. And then we're going to iterate over the input string. 
And now we're going to look at each character. So we look at each character in a switch, and we know that we have these special characters that we want to replace. So let's just get those. If the character is one of these, um, we need to replace it with a dash. If it's not one of these, then we keep the original character. So let's do that, space. So if it's one of these, then the new string should have a dash. Otherwise, the new string should have the original character. All right, and then we're gonna finally return a string version of our bytes. We can't mutate uh, strings, so we use a intermediate byte slice, and then we have to convert it to a string. So let's see if that helps. We can delete the regex as well now, and let's run our benchmark. So just so we know, uh, what was the numbers before? We was getting about 5,000 nanoseconds in operation before, and 16 allocations. Let's run it again. And we should see a pretty decent improvement. So we went from almost 5,000 nanoseconds to 2,000 nanoseconds. And it wasn't like we had to write a ton of extra code for it. And as a plus, we also got rid of an allocation, which is pretty nice. So now, let's see what else is taking up time. I already passed the dash CPU profile, so we can look at the same thing again. Go to a pprof. All right. So now we see a whole bunch of runtime functions. We're seeing this malloc gc grow slice make slice. I never call these functions grow slice or make slice. So where are they coming from? Let's have a look at one example. Um, list clean. So um, we don't see any calls to the runtime directly here. But if we instead look at the disassembly for clean, we'll see that, for example, uh, when we convert our byte slice to a string, it's actually calling a function, runtime.sliceByte to string. In this case, it's kind of obvious because we know that converting a byte slice to a string is going to need a copy. But sometimes it can be a little bit trickier to know where exactly why time's being spent somewhere or why an allocation is happening. So don't be afraid to look at the disassembly. You don't have to understand everything else that's going on. You just need to know, hey, there's a big number here and this function looks bad. <laughs> All right, so now we want to figure out why are we still taking so much time in this function. So let's have a look at this add text to name function. We see that a fair bit of time is being spent in this like append here. We saw the grow slice and append slice earlier and this append also has a fair bit of time. It's taking up a fair bit of time. What can we do to make this better? Well, when you declare a slice in this way, you're actually declaring an empty slice. It doesn't have a value, it doesn't have a capacity or anything. And so then it's gonna get an append. It's now gonna have to allocate a new slice, copy over, or there's nothing to copy initially, so it's fine. If it has to create a new slice, it just assumes, oh, I might need like one or two elements. And then I keep appending, and it has to again go, oh, I'm out of capacity. I have to create yet another slice, let me copy everything. And it just takes up time and it causes extra allocations that you can pretty easily avoid by setting a capacity for the slice. So in this case, we know that, hey, we're gonna get these four tags. There's only gonna be four tags because that's what we have here. So let's uh, pre-allocate that slice. And we can do that by using make. So the initial length is zero because we don't want anything in the slice, but we want to have a slice that has capacity for four elements. Similarly here for parts, parts takes every one of those keys and the name as well. So it's gonna have parts as just one bigger than um, the previous one. And we can append name here, delete this. All we've done is given our slice of capacity. Let's see how that helps. We run the same thing again. This is another reason why you write benchmarks is it's really easy to run benchmarks without having to run a load test and wait five seconds for a profile and so on. I'm able to run a benchmark in a second and get results here which show a huge perf increase from that one minor change. We pre-allocated our slice and we went from around 2,000 nanoseconds to 500 nanoseconds. And we also cut out about five of our allocations which is really huge as well. So now that we've done that, um, let's have a look at what else can we do. Is there anything else we could do in this code to optimize it? So we do list add tags again, just to see where time's being spent. And it's kind of all over the place. The clean function's still taking up a fair bit of time, but we've already optimized that. There's a whole bunch of like 
appends that are happening. There's a whole, there's a map lookup that this is something we're not going to be able to avoid. So there's not really much we can do there. A lot of time is also being spent in the strings.join. So what we're essentially doing here is we're building up a slice of each part of the final stats tag that we want, and then we're joining it by a dot, uh, by a period. This is a pretty inefficient way to solve the problem. Sometimes you have to step back and think, is this really the best way to do it efficiently? And in this case, we don't actually need a slice. All we need is a single string at the end with the periods and the keys at the right place. So what if instead of building up these intermediate temporary objects, we actually created a, a byte stop buffer and appended the, thing, uh, appended the keys right to that buffer so we didn't need any intermediate objects. So we can do that by going um, buff equals byte stop buffer. And instead of appending to this um, a slice, we would just write it out. Buff.write string name. And similarly here, we don't need to append anything. We could do buff.write string no dash plus k. But every time we append strings together, that's yet another allocation. And in this case, it's really easy to avoid. We just use um, two write strings. Same thing here. And now we're joining by a period. Instead of joining by period, we instead add a period in between each of the parts that we're adding. All right, so now instead of the strings.join, we can just do buff.string. However, we're still calling this clean function. Instead of uh, appending the clean version, we're creating an intermediate string and then we're appending the final string to the buffer. Instead of that, let's actually rewrite our clean function. So let's just call this write clean so that it takes the byte stop buffer and it writes out the cleaned up value to the buffer directly. So instead of creating a new string, we just go buff.write byte. And same thing again, we're gonna call byte write byte for C and then we no longer need new string at all. So we need to pass the buffer and the value that we're cleaning. Now let's have a look at how that affects our benchmark. So we run it again. Now it's really important that you have tests before you do any benchmarking like this because there's no point cleaning, uh, optimizing your code if you're just making it wrong. So in this case, don't worry, I have some tests. Um, I had the tests up here, so we're pretty sure our code is still correct. And we went from 500 nanoseconds to 364 nanoseconds. And more importantly, we went from 10 allocations to two allocations. And that shows the importance of kind of stepping back and rethinking your implementation sometimes. Now, some of you may be wondering, there's still two allocations. Could we get rid of these two allocations? So the first thing we need to do is figure out where are these allocations actually happening? And similar to uh, CPU profile, you can just pass dash mem profile. And that's now gonna profile your memory allocations and tell you exactly where you're allocating. So go to a pprof. And it shows you, oh, there's no data here. Why is that? It's because I was trying to uh, print what was active in the heap. It, that's what GoTool pprof normally does with a memory profile, but we actually care about where are allocations happening. And you can do that by calling GoTool pprof with this dash alloc underscore objects. So let's try that again, and we see that add tags to name is doing some allocations. Now there's two allocations here. One is the byte stop buffer that we're creating, and the second is converting that byte stop buffer to a string. The last one is unavoidable. At some point, we're, we're building up a new string, and that new string isn't something that's static. It's based on dynamic tags, so it can't just come out of nowhere. We do actually need to have that one allocation. But this allocation here, I'm not so sure we really need this allocation. Does anyone have any ideas of how you could get rid of this allocation here? Pull, exactly. So what you can do is you can use sync.pull to pull objects that are reusable. In this case, this byte stop buffer doesn't need to survive after this function. We need to use it to create our final string, but then the final string is a copy. Our byte stop buff can be reused to build some other stats name. So let's do that. Um, just as a note, whenever you're pooling, make sure it's only for uh, objects that are very cheap to create. For example, the byte stop buffer, all we do is create the byte stop buffer. 
There's no pre-computation needed. It's not expensive to create like a channel, uh, sorry, like a TCP connection. So it, it's perfect for um, this use case. But if you need something that's a little bit more expensive and you want to pull those, like TCP connections, for example, you need to either come up with your own pool or use something like a channel. And the reason is that there's no guarantee that objects you put in the pool will stay or stick around. The Go runtime can clear them at any point, and it actually does clear the buffer pool on every single GC. So I'll show you how to create a pool. So buff pool equals dot pool. All you need is a single function, which is new, and it returns an interface because we don't get generics. And that's all you need to do. You say exactly how to create your object. Now, instead of creating this buffer here, we can just do buff equals buff pool dot get and then cast it. And now when we're done with our buffer, which is at the end of this function, we can put it back in the pool. So we're just going to use defer to put it back in the pool. There is one slight issue with this code. Does anyone know what's wrong with it? Yep, exactly. I'm not resetting it and that's why you have tests because your tests get really angry and you'll see that, hey, I'm getting this like really long name and that's because your buffers are now being reused. So you have to make sure that you reset any objects that you're pulling back to their original state. So let's do that here. Luckily, bytes.buffer makes it easy. You can just call reset and we can run our test to make sure everything's fine. All right, let's run the benchmark again and see how we're doing. Interesting, so we got rid of the allocation, but now we've gone up in the amount of time we're spending. Does anyone know why we went up in the amount of time that's taken? So I heard a few people mention defer, and it's because of defer. So let's actually look at the CPU profile for this. So we can look at add tags. Um, and you can actually see there is a cost assigned to the defer itself. And uh, this one, yeah, De defer does end up costing you a little bit. So another way to look at this data would be from GoTorch. You can kind of see if you look at the add tags to name function, let me make it a little bigger, but here is the cost of defer. Defer is the actual defer function itself is taking up 5% of our time, and then running the deferred function is taking up a little bit more time, but that's because it's, it has to call the bytes, uh, the buff pool dot put as well. But you can see that defer does have a non-trivial overhead, but at the same time, this is only when you're working with something that's on the order of when you're talking about nanoseconds, that's when you care about the cost of defer. If you're making a HTTP request, don't question the use of defer. You're already at on the order of seconds, so don't even worry about it. Um, in this case, we can, just to see the difference, what we could do is we could actually get rid of the defer by doing But there is a kind of disadvantage to doing it this way, and that's that your code now is more brittle to it's now more brittle to changes where if I put a return here instead, now I'm no longer returning the buffer back to the pool when I'm done. And so it's not something I recommend. If you want to do this, at least abstract out the part that uses the buffer into a separate function. I normally prefer seeing code where it's something like, um, like buff pool dot get, follow, actually I have the buff pool dot get, use it here and like immediately return it. And so, that's the kind of code that you should have just to avoid these issues where as you change code in future, you stop um, pulling it. So this could be something like um, create tag, create stats tag using this buffer, pass it to a function. And then you can use returns in that function and everything's still fine. So in our case, let's now see if this actually helped. All right, there we go. So now we have one allocation and we got the lowest number of nanoseconds, 333 nanoseconds. That's a pretty low number. So I think I'm pretty happy with that number. Let's now go back to our final, um, well, what we originally were doing, which is see what the performance is compared to our original uh, handler, which wasn't tracking any metrics. So we run main.go and we're gonna do, first let's do simple again. So we're still seeing about 47,000, which is pretty good. Now let's run hello. 
and it's 42,000. So there you go. We went from about 30,000 requests per second to 43,000 requests per second. This is a much smaller difference, and it kind of shows the importance of profiling. We didn't lose any functionality. All we did is make our code faster and better. So uh, that's why profiling is important. All right. So I have a bit of a reference list of the commands we used during the profiling talk, and these slides will be available later. Um, yeah, kind of just the dash bench mem for printing the number of memory allocations, CPU profile and mem profile for recording these profiles when you're running tests. Um, you can also pass URLs directly. All right, so some of the lessons. First thing is don't actually, even though I'm teaching you to profile and optimize, don't optimize prematurely. Profile your code, find what is actually causing your code to be slow, and that's what you need to focus on. There's no point in me jumping straight into the stats and trying to optimize it if that wasn't the actual issue that was causing our code to be slow. Uh, Go makes it really easy to profile your code, so take advantage of the tools and find out what exactly is slow before you optimize it. Second thing is to avoid allocations in the hot part. We kind of saw the difference between a 16 allocation version versus the two allocation version. We went from over, I think it was like 5,000 nanoseconds to 333. That's more than an order of magnitude improvement, and a lot of that is just avoid allocations. And it's not because the GC is slow. The GC is actually pretty great. It's just that every time you allocate, the runtime has to do extra work to find some space. It has to zero out that memory. It has to do extra work for you. So allocations aren't free. So try to avoid them in the hot path. And some, one of the easiest ways to do that is give your slices a predefined capacity. If you know your slice is only going to get up to 10 elements, make it with a capacity of 10. It helps a ton with the GC. Um, and the third thing is, don't be afraid to look at the disassembly. It can seem a little bit daunting seeing all these assembly instructions, your three-line function becomes 100 lines of assembly, but at the same time, you don't actually need to understand all of the assembly. There's only a few bits you, which you care about. Most of the time, you'll see call, which is calling some function, and some runtime function name, and that's, that's all you really care about. So. Don't worry too much about, uh, don't be afraid of it. And that's all I had. Um. <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, question to this assembly. In the past, when compiling Go, I found an option to get it to skew out this assembly at the compile phase, but I believe that that was a plain line assembly. Mm -hmm. But this was like a real thing. Uh, this is uh, this has always existed inside of pprof. pprof. Pprof, you can see, but there is still actually a way. There is still like go tools success or some some command. There is a way to still get at the disassembly if you want. But most of the time, you're probably looking at the disassembly for profiling anyway. So it kind of makes sense to look at it from inside of pprof. Well, yeah, from the C plus plus phase, I got used to looking at disassembly. Yeah. How affordable things were. Yeah, it's got a new language introduction. Like, oh my god, I never do this. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks. No worries. So the question was, for, for the pprof endpoint, if you're not using a HTTP server, is there any alternatives? And I kind of mentioned you can use the runtime package to start a trace and write it to disk immediately. That's one way. A lot of the time, you should probably be writing benchmarks in your code to actually um, figure out where the issues are. Um, I think like there was an earlier talk that mentioned you can expose pprof over your Unix socket, right? You have to write some sort of wrapper which takes the request over Unix sockets or shared memory or whatever it may be, and then it basically will use the same pprof runtime code to generate the profile and send it back over that transport. How many words per minute can you type? <laughs> <laughs> so an interesting fact is I don't even know how to touch type properly. I use like a combination of five to six fingers, and I get to about 100 words per minute. <laughs> yep. Yep, the question was, will I be posting the code? And actually, it's up on GitHub already, and I kind of have a list of like, each of the improvements I make is like a separate commit as well, so you should be able to find this information. From, it'll be linked from the slides. Cool? Any other questions? Oh.
Uh, it seems like a lot of your ideas are going to change screen manipulation type of project. Mm -hmm. Do you find that to be a common issue that you encounter? Uh, I don't think it's a common issue for me. Usually string, you're not manipulating strings too often. It depends on what you're doing. In this case, the activity itself was string munging. And that's why instead of string munging it using strings.join, I found myself dealing with bytes. But a lot of the same principles apply to if you're optimizing your business logic. Same thing, you might be creating unnecessary slices or slices that have no capacity set and so on. Those kind of principles apply regardless of the underlying types. I was wondering if there was a So, so the other thing is, yep, I think at the same time, it's worth using, for example, regexes were really slow initially, right? It's about using the right tool at the right time. Regexes are great for some use cases. It's just that in this use case, it was in the hot path, it wasn't worth using. Not all code is in your hot request path. So I would actually say you don't want a linter that says don't use regexes because regexes are great and you do want to use them, just not in your hot request path. Cool. Any other questions? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Unfortunately, there's no service right now that can like just run the benchmark on every single pull request on GitHub or something. If someone wants to create a startup that does that, that'd be really great. So for me personally, it's um, anytime I do any big change, like if I'm adding a new feature, I want to make sure it doesn't affect performance in a negative way. I don't. I don't have a good enough habit of running it before every single pull request, but I will at least run it like once a week to make sure that things haven't broke, uh, broken. But if I do find that my performance has gotten worse suddenly, I can at least go back into my commit history and run the benchmarks and see where did it get worse. Cool. All right. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.